Thank you very much. It's really an honor for me to be here. I do not claim to be an academic. I do not know every detail of the documentation of this very important subject of the banana sim and their return. I am primarily a rabbi and a teacher, in many ways a pastor, to people who discover their Jewish roots and then want to return. And I've been doing this for three decades. So you may ask, how did a Ashkenazic Jew from Brooklyn, New York, raised in Bridgeport, Connecticut, a rabbi in New Jersey for 15 years, and then all of a sudden, 30 years ago, becomes the rabbi in El Paso, Texas. How did he get involved in this incredible subject? In August of 1986, I came to the community of Benetzion in El Paso. And two days later, I met a young, a young man from Juarez, Mexico, right on the border of Juarez, who came to say, I have to talk to you, Rabino. I did not even know what that meant, to tell you the truth. And he came and he told me a story, a story that many of you have heard already. But when he told it to me, I really, it, I, I didn't connect at first. His story was that his grandmother had just died two weeks ago in uh, Juarez. He's a religious Catholic. But ever since he was a little boy, and he was about in his 40s now, he said he was the only member of his family that on Friday night she would take him into a dark room in the house, light two candles, say a prayer in a language he didn't understand, and following that, they would come upstairs for a big meal on Friday night. And he said that uh, she had died two weeks ago. And so he had asked his mother, will you please uh, carry on that tradition in honor of grandma? And, uh, and she refused, and he couldn't understand it. And he went from relative to relative to relative. And finally, he wouldn't let go of this. Nobody would do it. And so they told him to go to see the priest in Juarez, which he did. And the priest in Juarez told him that there were hundreds, hundreds of women in Mexico lighting candles on Friday night who were Catholic. And he knows why they're doing it, but he should see a rabbi. And if, the, if he can't find a rabbi, then go back to the priest. Where is there a rabbi? El Paso. I had just gotten there. And so he's sitting in front of me. And he tells me the story. So he says to me, Rabino, why am I here? I said, well, you know, this is a Jewish custom, at which point I thought he was going to fall off his chair. And he said, well, why would my grandmother be doing a, a Jewish custom? And when I talked to him about the Inquisition, and, and I'm going to say this 50 times because I know we're in a tight schedule, and Avi Gross, um, I'm giving you a little bit of uh, liberal time because uh, you spoke at my community last year, and I was very uh, generous to you, so I expect the same, <laughs> same in return. So anyway, um, at the end of the day, he asked me if he could come to my synagogue. I said, any time you want. He started coming. I don't know if he, I don't really know what happened in that particular case. But I will tell you this, to this day, this gentleman comes every Yom Kippur. He spends the entire day in the synagogue. We acknowledge each other. I know why he's there. And uh, end of that story. Two days later, another similar incident of a, an attorney in El Paso, Texas, who uh, tells me that um, her aunt just died. And following the funeral, I, there was a mass at the church, funeral in a Catholic cemetery. They came home, and she sees that her nieces are all sitting on low benches, all the mirrors are covered, and they're eating round objects. And she says to her nieces, why are you doing that? And they said to her, well, our mother um, told us that she had Jewish roots, and when anyone died in the family, she would do this. So we do the same thing. She says, you mean your mother, my mother's sister, had Jewish roots? My mother never told me about it. Well, we're just doing this. Well, what do these customs mean? We have no idea. And so she just coincidentally calls me, and I start explaining these traditions. <coughs> now, two incidents in three days, you begin to think, El Paso, Texas, what's going on here? And then the final thing that happened that week was the cable guy, and I don't mean Jim Carrey. The cable guy comes to my house to install cable television. And when I left New Jersey as a joke, they gave me a little sign. And it says on it, Shalom ya all, which you don't say in New Jersey. I'm telling you, you don't say Shalom ya all. And so uh, it's still over my fireplace. So this cable gentleman says to me, um, are you Jewish? I said, not only am I Jewish, I'm a rabbi. 
And he, with that, he says, I'm Jewish too. And he opens his shirt and he's wearing a big mug and dove. You know, one of those big ones where your head has to sue, it's so heavy. And he says to me, uh, I'm Jewish too. And I said, well, really, where do you go to shul? He says, what's shul? I said, where do you go to synagogue? He said, um, I haven't decided yet. I said, why haven't you decided yet? He said, I found, just found out I was Jewish. I said, how'd you find out you were Jewish? He says, a month ago, my grandmother calls uh, all of her grandchildren over to her house. It wasn't a birthday, it wasn't a celebration, and she has 10 grandchildren. And she says to us, um, I have to tell you something. What is it? She goes under the bed and she brings out a box. This is what he's telling me. And in the box there happens to be uh, 10 objects. Coincidental, 10 grandchildren, 10 objects. And each one of these objects has Jewish roots. And she reveals to her grandchildren that she has Jewish roots, tells them a little bit about the story, says this has been in her family from generation to generation to generation. And she tells each one of them to pick one of these objects. And uh, there was, from what he described to me, a kiddush cup, a menorah, a Bible in Hebrew and Spanish, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He happened to pick the Jewish star. Now I began to really get curious, and I started to do research, and I could not find any help anywhere. It was just, this is 30 years ago, remember. And so um, there was a rabbi uh, emeritus, now I'm an emeritus too, uh, and in, uh, at the Reform Synagogue in town, and he had written a book called Roots and Boots about the early history of the Jews of El Paso. So I called him up and I asked him if he knew anything about this phenomenon. I had studied about Moranos in, in rabbinical school and other places, but I never met anybody in, in all the years I was in New Jersey. And now I haven't stopped meeting them. Well, there was a rabbi Plotnik in, uh, Plotkin rather, in Phoenix, a reform rabbi. I spoke to him briefly, but that was it. And then it began to happen. And then uh, a few years later, the Society for Crypto-Judaic Studies had a conference in El Paso. And one of the organizers of that, Stan Hortis, gave this lecture about the crypto-Jews of the Southwest. And now it began to register. So I'm going to fast forward. 30 years later, folks, I have been involved in this movement not as a scholar, but I have been working with people in my community, in Juarez, and in other remote communities in New Mexico where there are no rabbis, where there are no synagogues. And all of a sudden, I became sort of a spiritual magnet for these people. And as I was doing it, it reminded me of an event that happened many, many years ago. It was at my bar mitzvah. My bar mitzvah occurred on Cholamoid Sukkot, Shabbat Cholamoid Sukkot, the festival of Sukkot. But the secular date was October 12th, Columbus Day. Now, I was just barely 13 at the time, and Columbus was my hero, and Ferdinand and Isabella were my heroes because they funded the trip. And if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here for my bar mitzvah, so I was really thrilled. Two days before my bar mitzvah, I had a conversation with my grandfather, who was from Grodner, Poland, an Ashkenazic Jew. And I said, Grandpa, I really would like to learn a little bit about your life, you know, before my bar mitzvah. Tell me a little bit about, about you. And he says, I'm going to tell you something that no one has ever asked me. And then he began to cry, and he said, you know, I had the same conversation with my grandfather at, uh, at his bar mitzvah. Let me tell you something. His name was, I only knew him as Morris Leon. That was his name. And he said, you know, when I came over to, this, to the States from Poland, uh, they changed my name from Moshe Leon to Morris Leon. He said, but I have to tell you something. Even though we're Ashkenazic Jews, we did Sephardic practices. Like what? And he said, for example, he said, my grandfather before me was Moshe Leon. And his grandfather before him was Moshe Leon. And his grandfather before him, that's not, and they were all alive at the time that they were named. It wasn't, that's not our tradition. Our tradition is to name in, in memory of a deceased relative. And he said, to tell you the truth, there is a, a story in our family that we go all the way back to the 13th century. And he said, did you ever hear of Moshe de Leon? And I said, no, <laughs> and I didn't. Well, he was the founder of Kabbalah. Always remember that. So that, so honestly, that came to my mind at the time of, that I got involved with all of this. I look around this room and I see I see my heroes. I see heroes in this community that are here at this incredible conference. And it is such an honor for me to be here. For 13 years, we have had an Anosim conference in El Paso, Texas. And I see uh, Seth Kunin, who was one of our keynote speakers. 
and David Gitlitz, one of our keynote speakers. Last year, Avi Gross was our keynote speaker. Uh, Rabbi Juan Mejia, who's sitting over there with his hand on his chin. Uh, and Rabbi Nisan Ben Avraham, who, uh, who, was, who was raised as a Catholic in Mallorca and now is a rabbi in Israel. I had the opportunity at the Sephardic Center in the old city of Jerusalem to perform a wedding with two Orthodox rabbis uh, signing the ketubah. It's unheard of a conservative rabbi doing a wedding. Don't tell the country of Israel they might uh, deport me today. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> Don't tell them, please. I performed the wedding at the Sephardic Center. And if you've ever been there, there's a big mural. And on the mural is Ferdinand and Isabella in the middle. and talks about the, the, um, the, the travels of the Sephardim to Israel. And what's really great is that the four people holding the, holding the chuppah, we made sure that the backs, the rear ends of the bride and groom were to Ferdinand and Isabella. <laughs> and they were saying on this great day of love, we are here and we are well and we have returned. And the resolution also was that we will remember and we will work together and welcome the return of the B'nai Anasim. I always end this talk with a, with a prayer. Um, and it's a prayer that we all know. Those of us who, who go to synagogue, that is. When we return the Torah, we all rise and we say the words, Hashivenu Adonai Elecha v'nashuva Hadesha Menu Kekedem. I don't know if you're aware, but where that comes from is the Book of Lamentations, the Book of Echa that is read on Tisha B'Av. And it's really not the last verse, it's the second to last verse, but we repeat it on the saddest day on the Jewish calendar. And even though Jeremiah wrote the words and did not know that the Spanish Inquisition was going to take place on the same day, I think maybe he really did know. So I would just like to uh, conclude my comments by chanting the Hashivenu to a Ladino melody. Hashivenu Adonai Elecha v'nashuvam Hashivenu Adonai Elecha v'nashuvam Chadesh Yameinu Yameinu Kekedem Hashivenu Adonai Hashivenu Adonai Return us, O Lord, and we shall return. Renew our days as of old.